Hey guys, it's the captain here, and welcome to another episode of the Captain Meets on Andersons TV. And today we've got Jared Nichols over, all the way from America. Here um, I am. Yeah, I know, and it's cool. So I spotted you guys were doing some dates over here. I, I, I asked um, the guys from Blackstar Hill. I know you know if you wouldn't mind swinging by, and here you go. So what are you doing in the UK? Well, first off, I got to say that I'm a huge fan of the show. And when I eat my breakfast and I put on YouTube TV in the morning, I always got to find an Anderton's video. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, everything's great. Uh, we've been in the UK now for uh, two weeks, touring with Walter Trout. And now we're out on another run with a band called Scorpion Child. And yeah, we're just, we're just getting loud everywhere. Oh, you know, it's just playing. How many dates are you doing in the UK? I think in total it's 22 dates. Oh, fantastic. So yeah, it's great, man. I mean, it's, it's funny because I never really thought that I would come here and be able to, to play. And it, it's just weird. Every time it keeps getting better. And we just keep coming back and kicking ass, and that's that. Oh, cool. So look, I kind of, I guess if, if anybody's um, unfamiliar with you, they've, yeah. they've, or, or if they are familiar, sorry, they've probably just found you on YouTube because you kind of, you, you've become like one of these uh, emerging kind of rock gods on YouTube over the last year or two. Um, but tell us a little bit about, you know, life back home and how you first started playing the guitar and, you know. Yeah, man. Well, like originally I just started like everybody, you know, I was like 15 years old. Everyone was either picking sports or, music or what it, whatever it is and um i wanted to be a drummer mm -hmm. and i got a drum set a conda drum set like got it home i started playing 10 minutes later my parents walked downstairs they're like nope <laughs> way too loud <laughs> and uh my dad goes why don't you get a guitar you can take it with you and i was like man everybody plays guitar i don't want to play guitar but then like i started learning a few riffs on like a friend's guitar and the thing that always made me mad was when you jam you jam like black sabbath or something Guys wouldn't get the riffs right. And I was like, that doesn't sound right, that's not right. And then I'd learn it and show it to them. And then after a while, I was just like, you know what, I'm gonna play. Yeah. And then I was playing all the classic rock stuff and I first heard like Steve Ray Vaughan and at like the bridge broke and I was like, oh man, I wanna do that. And ever since then, I was just, just like everybody, I was obsessed with playing. I mean, Woodshed, you know, I'd play those 12 hour days just trying to learn to play, you know. And I was one of those guys. And I didn't, it was right before like YouTube hit. Yeah. And then once YouTube hit, I, would, I could see all this live footage and then it was just, it was insane. But I mean, since I was 15, I've been playing in clubs in the Midwest. And then, you know, I, I figured I had to do something with a career. I had to, to go somewhere because it really wasn't happening there. Right. So I moved to LA. Is, is that tough, do you think, for, uh, you know, most guitarists can probably relate to this wherever you are in the world. Did you, did you just find it tough that your hometown just, you were never gonna have the breaks? That oh yeah, oh yeah. It, it was almost like, no matter what I did, how hard I pushed, it was always, there was a wall there. Yeah. And you know, finding musicians to play with and you know, trying to find real gigs, you know, it was horrible. Yeah. It was very depressing. And I remember I was sitting in, in my room and I was shedding, it was like a Friday night. And my mom walks in and she's like, she just kind of said, what are you gonna do? Yeah. And I was like, I don't know what, what I should do. She's and like, how I, old are you at this point? I was 18. Oh, okay. Yeah. So still pretty young. Pretty young. So this is what, deciding whether you're gonna you know, go to university or? Exactly, uh, exactly. If I was gonna get a, a regular job, you know, work, work at a factory yeah. or go to school or, you know, I always, want, I always knew I wanted to be a player. Did you get, sorry to go back a, a year or two, but did you literally, you first started playing guitar at 15 and by 18 you had the kind of chops that you've... Yeah, you that's, know... That's a pretty... You know, it's funny, believe it or window. not, uh, I started at 15 and when I was 17, I went to uh, like a summer program at Berkeley in Boston Yeah, and I got a full scholarship to Berkeley. <laughs> I mean, believe it or not, and some people are going to watch it and they're going to go, no way, but it actually happened. And I actually went to Berkeley for about six months when I was 18 and I hated it. Really? Yeah. What, too controlling or Oh too yeah. I mean, I knew, I always wanted to play rock, I wanted to play blues, and, but I, I was so open to everything else. Yeah. But when I got there, it was, it was a situation like, you're going to do this and you're going to yeah. like this. You already know how to do that. We, you know come come to this side of everything you know and i just found as i was there i was like starting to lose what i loved about music and it was just and a lot of people would disagree but for me it it just kind of i don't know i started to worry about what i played on guitar and i didn't want to mm -hmm. take chances anymore and you know and it, it's just like the 
I always had that raw instinct where I just want to play and be out playing. It's know? funny that, isn't it, how you sort of, I mean, I see, we have a fantastic music college locally to Guildford here, um, maybe not as well known as, as Berkeley, but certainly, you know, very well known even internationally. And you do see, you do hear sort of mixed experiences from, you know, there absolutely there are guys who go in there at a certain level and come out at a whole different level and it's worked completely for them. Yep. And there are other guys who feel like they go backwards, yep. you, you know, and, and where it just doesn't. But so, yeah, I think you've got to be, it's not a magic wand, is it, going to music college? And no, and I think that's kind of a thing that young guys need to understand too is, you know, if you want to do it and you want to be a player, it's up to you to do it. No, mm -hmm. no school, no, no one else is going to help you. It's yeah. truly up to you to, to learn and to figure out how you want to sound, you know, and yeah, there's, there's no easy way out. No. It is literally what you're prepared to put in is what you will get exactly. back. Um. Exactly. So um, I love this kind of, because it's almost like the, the, the going to LA is almost like cliche, isn't it? It's like the stereotypical, oh, yeah. whether you're a musician or an actor or whatever, it's like the bright lights. So tell me about that kind of journey and you know, how did, did, did you literally buy like a, a one-way ticket on a bus and that, was it that, was it literally like that? This is what happened. <laughs> I worked a, a landscaping and like farming job before I moved to LA in Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah like a legit farming job. And it was, it was to the point where I was like, okay, I need to save this amount of money to rent a car to drive to LA because a flight would be too expensive with my guitars, wow. right? So wow. I was like, because I didn't have any money, you know? And it was like, okay, so I worked for like six months at this job, raised, after like everything, I raised like four grand or so, rented a car, drove out to LA with my dad, drove into Hollywood, got an apartment, and it was like, it was the scene of like a kid not knowing anything about the world, showing up with his guitar in his bag, and there's, you know, there's hookers there and heroin there and hobos there, and, and it was like, where am I? I thought I was like in like a little version of like the devil's playground, you know? And I would just, I remember when I got to LA, I was like, man, I gotta find somewhere to play, somewhere to jam, right? So I walk into a club, the first thing that happens, and they're like, yeah, it's an open <coughs> jam. Uh, it's $15 to get in, and then you write your name on the list, and then we'll get you up to play. And I remember I walked in, and I was like, well, I can't just sit here, so I ordered a beer. I ordered the beer, and the, the keg like broke. And it broke all over me, all over my guitar, <laughs> and all over the bartender. And he's like, oh, you can just have the beer. And he gave me a cup of foam. And I walked in with my guitar, and there was a bunch of old guys in there that have probably lived in LA forever. Put my name on the list, and I, I waited for an hour. And then I went up to the guy and I was like, hey, is there any chance I could come up and play? He goes, yeah, we'll get you. We have some other friends coming up first. 
waited for another hour, waited for the third hour. And then I said to the guy, man, I paid to come in to play. You know, is there any way I can get up? And he goes, well, you know, you, that's not how this works. He's like, you just paid to get in. You just can't come in here and play. I don't know who you think you are. And it was almost like, welcome to LA, right? So the whole game changed. And then I realized that it was like, you know, it's one thing to be a player, but yeah. you also have to go through so many different things daily just to get to another, you know, to another spot or to find musicians. And it's just crazy, man. So what was the break then? You know, was it gradual or was there one thing? There was happened? one thing. Okay. And the one thing was right when I moved to LA, they had a, I saw a flyer for a contest and it was the Les Paul tribute contest. Right. And I was like, Oh man, it was like win a Les Paul gold top and uh, a string endorsement from Daddario and get a feature in Guitar Player Magazine. Yep. And I was like, oh shit, I gotta do this, right? So they were like, send a demo in, like, and I didn't have anything. So I went on like GarageBand and I put like a loop drum and a loop bass and I just played over it. And I remember I was like, I sent it in and I was like, man, hopefully I'll hear back. And like three weeks later I heard back, like I was one of the 20 guys and uh, I remember the day of the contest, I was like nervous, but like ready to rock. And there was all these great players there. And you had to pick like your spot out of a hat. And I was the last guy to go. And I was like, man, I got to do it. And I, I did it and I won. And I won like a Les Paul and, and all this stuff. But one of the guys that was a judge, there was like uh, Michael Melinda from Guitar Player, guitars from Super Tramp, Steely Dan. Uh, and there was another guy, his name is Phil Jargui. And he owned a studio in LA. And he said to me, um, oh man, after, after I won it, he's like, when can I hear your band play? I was like, I don't have a band. He's like, well, do you sing? I was like, not really. He's like, do you, do you have any songs? I was like, not really. <laughs> and he's like, well, get some guys, come to my studio, start jamming. So we go to his studio and it was, it was just like that. It was like, we showed up with our guitars and I was like, well, let's jam some Hendrix. Let's jam this and started writing some riffs. And I started trying to sing and you know, and then there was like a point where I was like, man, everything came down to that. And it was like, you know what? If I really want to do this, I got to put everything into it more than I already have. And that's one thing I always thought too, is like, you know, a lot of guys play and they're like, man, if I can just get this good, then everything will be great. Or if I just reach this level, I can play that solo or that solo. And you know, as well as I do, it just doesn't work like that. There's always so many more mountains to climb. And that's the thing that is it's bittersweet about it because you know you reach one step and then you realize you're like man i have so much further to go and it's like everything for touring you know sleeping in a van for years now and you get to this point you're like you know oh we get a tour with zach wilde or whatever and then it's like we get there and then we climb that hill and then there's just another one right there so it's just you know it's crazy like that i want to talk about your um Technique, and yeah. I, I don't know whether or not maybe we should switch to the other guitar now because, of course, you're you're a, you're a sort of a plectrum free yeah player, which is unusual in the first place, and you're also kind of the, the guitar I've seen you play most is is a Les Paul Custom with a single P90 yeah. back. Mm -hmm. So there's really you know everything's in I guess you know a lot is in your right hand maybe yeah. more than most players would be. So or I don't mind. I just thought if we played on 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 that guitar, it's because it's kind of you, you've then just got your one back pickup. But yeah. where, where did that technique develop yeah. from? You know what's funny is like a lot of people like would have no idea, but I I used to play like a Strat with a pick through like a Super Reverb, and I I had a Tube Screamer on the floor, and it was like Texas Blues mm -hmm. all the way. And it was funny because like when I'd play, I loved it, and I just loved Stevie so much. But like after a while, it sounds funny, but like people would come up to me and be like, man. It sounded great, man. It sounds like Steve, you know, sound just like Stevie, you know. And I was like, that's amazing. Obviously, like I was like, that's great. But after a while, I was like, I somewhere in the back of my head, I was like, when am I going to sound like me? How do I sound like me? Yeah. And I think that most guys, they don't think about that enough because I mean, it's all good to sound like everybody else, but you got to do something that's you know refreshing and that makes you inspired to play. And yeah. if anything, when I dropped the pick, it started, I'd put the pick right here and I'd do like this and I'd start playing like that. And then after a while, I'd put on the amp and just use my fingers. But I mean, it inspires me to play and, it, and I take more chances without it. And it, the way it developed was really simple. Like, I didn't really think about it. And a lot of people ask me about the technique. Like, how do, how do you play like that? How do you make it sound like you're playing with a pick and when you're not? And I don't really think about it. Because you're not, it's not like you've got a, 
it's not like using your nails or anything. No, it's, it's just really just like the, the the skin of your thumb. The funny part is like with a pick, right? You're up. Say you're alternate picking. Mm -hmm. For me, it's more like I'll take a, a, the thumb and it's it's right. up and down like that, right? So so the thumb is always a downstroke, and then the index is an up, and then with these three, I'll, I can do like the. But the most thing is like I try not to think about it, and I just just really dig in and. The, the biggest influence from that was like Albert King. Right. And Albert King's not a fast player. He's, you know, there's nothing about his technique yeah. that you would go, oh my God, but nobody sounds like him, you know, and he has such a different style. So it's, so it's not really a, <clears throat> it's not really a, there's no real country kind of background there, then it's more just mm. like. Um, not really. It's not like a, it's not like you were a finger picking kind of guitar player and you've no. kind of developed that into. It was, it was almost like I, I developed it because and it sounds cheesy, but like when, when I first started playing, I tried to play with my, my thumb. Mm -hmm. And um, my first guitar teacher said to me, you, I can't teach you if you're right. just going to play with your thumb. Actually, I played because I, I write left handed. Okay. And I was playing lefty, and he goes, I can't teach you if you're lefty. And I was like, okay, so I'll play righty. And then it was a thing, well, you got to play with a pick if you want to learn how to play. And it just turned into this thing where it was always, there's so many rules, and everyone has these rules, these, these made up rules. Yeah. And it's all crap i mean honestly yeah. there are no rules and that's the part for me where it was like you know what and people said dude you're never going to be able to just play with your finger you can't play like a you know and it's like jeff beck like what do you mean you can do whatever you want yeah and then you look yeah. at a guy like wes montgomery who's you know playing with his thumb and no one can hold a candle so yeah. to me it's like you can do whatever you want man um, um, what was the point as well where you did, did you have a, a guitar and you just realized you were never using the pickup switch or anything you were just yeah. always on this pickup or did you or was it that you to, to be yeah. honest like when it comes because like even on like this guitar yeah. that I got every guitar I have is only a bridge pickup and like the truth is like I would have brought my single pickup Les Paul but I've beaten the hell out of that thing so bad that we only had a few days in between the runs yeah. and I was like, and I love that, that's my guitar. But it was to the point where I was like, man, I, this thing needs frets, it needs everything, oh, really? you know? But on all my guitars, I only play on the bridge pickup. And a lot of people would say, man, you're limiting yourself to tones. But actually it's, it's a lot different because when you limit yourself, I think in certain ways, like one of my favorite players is Leslie <coughs> West from Mountain. Okay. It's, it's just like there's so much you can do with one. It's all about you switching it up, you know? And I see like interviews with guys and they talk about these crazy pedal boards and all this stuff. And then and then I see like a guy like, like I saw a video, Joe Bonamassa just talking about volume and tone knob. And I'm like, that's where it's at. You know, that's totally where it's at. Yeah. But in two, playing with your fingers, you can feel every note underneath. And I think there's something to be said with that. A lot of guys just, they, they play and they pick. And it's just like, that's all great, but like, Every note I play, I feel it, and it sounds maybe sounds cheesy, but like that's the connection for me. Yeah, it's an interesting because I, I think I've kind of, you know, in the twenty something years or whatever that I've played guitar, you, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've never, I think I've just ebbed and flowed from. Sometimes I have amplifiers with lots of channels on them. Sometimes yeah. I'm, you know, sometimes I have bigger pedal boards. Mm -hmm. Certainly, more recently, it's all been about. Actually, do you know what? If I could just have one pedal or two pedals and an yeah. amp with a nice reverb on it, and yeah, and I think people kind of need to realize that too. That you know, it's just a medium between you and the music. Yeah. And you know, for a guy like me, like this, a pedal, this this black star, and it's like one pickup, and let's go. You know, it's I don't need much more because when you're jamming, it's just like you do what well, you do. I'm intrigued anyway because you don't see these everywhere. The dear, I can't remember what is this the 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 Odin, the yeah, Odin, the Odin. That's Odin. right. And uh, I gather this was a gift from Zach yeah. from the last tour. Yeah, we toured with Zach, and he hooked me up with all of his models from his company, and uh, I brought one out on the run. I'm lo I'm loving the uh, industrial strap buttons on this. I'll be honest, right. man, because I'll go up and do these <laughs> things. You can see on my hands, I got all these. Uh, oh, you've smashed oh, it on there. Oh, they're they're knuckle busters, man. But let's let's have a little listen yeah, to yeah, this because yeah. you you've. Um, Maybe we can. I know it's got uh, uh, two pickups on that, but they're not uh, they're not wired in, are they? Those? No. So, like I said before, I I just play in the bridge pickup. So, like this one I got from Duncan. This was one of like the original Frankenstrat pickups. Mm -hmm. Like, so it's an old one. And I mean, nothing uh, against EMGs, but 
for me and and for the sound that I try and get, you know, just that I just want a hot hot ass PAF and. I can imagine, to, to be it. honest with you, again, particularly when you talk about you know playing with your fingers and doing a lots of dynamically. That's the one thing that I think the EMG, particularly that's well, probably just the set of EMGs that Zach uses are not a naturally dynamic set. Yeah, you know, they're pretty totally. much kind of like they're, always. And that's a thing, like like a dog on a leash, isn't it? Like get back, get back. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know? And like for me, like I love like. I love Zach's playing and I love like Pride and Glory and all that. And when I play that, I'm like, gee, this thing's slamming, yeah. you know, but, but I feel like when I go back to play blues or, you know, anything else, it just helps to have a little bit more response yeah. in the back pickup. Should, we, should I play it a little yeah, bit? Yeah, just play it. Those nice rakes across the <laughs> with like the muted strings as you just yeah kind of that's a, a that's the thing too like when I when I play without a pick you know I always seem to really and then too you can start to do like little weird things where it's like you start start hopping around the string. You know, it's it's fun, man, and like I don't even think about it. Like, you know, a lot of people would think, "What are you thinking about?" And I mean, some guys are like, "Dude, your technique sucks," and I'm really? like, "Hey, you know, it is what it is." You know, that's hard. I I that's fuss about. I desperately try not to judge yeah. other players. You know, because if they're making music that inspires them and inspires other people, then yeah. That's all good. Totally. Uh, what do you, do you do? Are you a big, do you use the volume control Oh, much, all the time, it, yeah. Right. So like, so if I'm playing, obviously you have full on. Everyone can do full on, right? Yeah. And uh, let's see, all the way back. use the tone a lot too so like I'll try and I'll, I'll obviously back off to get like that thing going on and uh, you know I do a lot of weird weird stuff too. kind of effect. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. So it's... I mean, truth be told, I do listen to like old country. So like, it's funny when I listen to old country, I try and do like pedal steel stuff. <laughs> but you know, those guys, those guys are crazy, man. But I just do whatever I hear it's going on, you know? So when did you first start uh, using Blackstar amps? I picked up Blackstar like right when I moved to LA. Okay. So the, the studio that we rehearsed at, they were like sponsored by Blackstar. So like, I would go in there, I would like go in there at like nine in the morning, right when they opened, and they'd be like, oh, is there any rooms available? And they'd be like, yeah, you can go in there, because they, they always knew I was coming. You can go in there and play or whatever. And uh, so I'd go in and there would be like, 
uh, artist, artisan, and yep. like a series one. It was like, this was like five years ago, so like they were just coming in. Yeah. And I go in there and I just blow my eardrums out, you know, just f hearing what sounded better, what sounded, you know. And I always loved these amps, and it was funny because I played, you know, back Fenders, Marshalls, everything. Yeah. But the one thing about the Black Star is they've always delivered, and like, especially now for touring, you know, when we played like last year, we were here, we did over 100 dates, and I used the same amp every day. And it never died. You know, it was it was cool. And you know, you know what's going to happen tonight, don't you? It's going to die. <laughs> it's going to blow up. <laughs> and I'm going to blow up with it. It's going to go on fire. And my hair is going to catch on fire. No, but I think it's a cool thing because you know, as much as um, <coughs> as much as there is a huge amount of love for vintage amplifiers. Yeah. Therein lies the biggest problem most of the time, isn't it? It's just you know reliability I, I, is such a problem. Yeah, and for me, you know, I. I, I have a love-hate relationship with vintage stuff in general mm -hmm. because most of the vintage guitars I play um, and amplifiers, yeah, they sound great, but a lot of them don't feel great and they have quirks, the amps. Yeah. You know, you can't, I don't care who you are, you know, like you can't just go tour with this old stuff and expect it to, to hold up, yeah. you know, the, the amps and yeah. And these, this is like the perfect medium for me because mm -hmm. I mean, like this amp, the, the artist, it has all of the the tones you'd want to get and it can cover a lot of ground and especially you know when you're playing at gig volume and you know we're yeah. playing these theaters and stuff it's like they're just slamming and i mean 30 watts even that guy that guy just sounds it sounds like a pissed off you know cranked up little twin you know it's i think you know 15 and 30 watt valve amplifiers are the perfect club yeah man kind of amplifier aren't they? yeah i mean that you don't need much more and i i always laugh because we do these runs and I'll show up and I'll have like my guitar, you know, like I'll have the black Les Paul yeah. with the single pickup, one of these and like a, a fuzz or something. And these guys got, you know, JCM 800s and, you know, these old plexis and these hundred watts and stuff. And we're playing like clubs and I'm like, man, at least I can turn this thing up a little bit to get yeah. a little, little, you know, bottom out of it. But it's funny because the Black Star stuff, like I said, it's always been slamming and the guys over there, they know what they're doing and they, they care as much about the product as I do. You yeah. know, as a player, you want someone that's like gonna stand behind their products. And anytime I've ever asked them anything or come, come up with anything, you know, there's always a solution. You know, there's not a lot of companies where you can go, you know, hey man, what if we try this? Or what if I try and do this with it? Will this work? And they get back to you. Like most guys are just like, hey man, this is what we do. Either you like it or you don't, yeah. you know. Well, that's and pedal wise, what, what are you, I mean, I know <sighs> we're using a, a pedal from our, uh, yeah, veritable selection behind this. But what would what would normally be on your board? It's funny. I've gone through like uh, I had like an old fuzz face for a while. Um, honestly, a tube screamer, any sort of dirt pedal that's that's more of like an overdrive. Yeah, like a, a TS 808 forever. Uh, Zach gave me a bunch of his stuff. I was using some of that like the he has his like signature pedal. That's great. Um, otherwise, I've been using a company called Greer. I don't know. Though. It's like a, it's a it's in Georgia. It's a guy right. he hand makes pedals. But I mean, Basically anything. I'm really not picky with what I play. You know, like I'll I'll, I'll play a telly if it feels good. I'll play whatever, and uh, just as long as it's got a bridge pickup and a yeah. volume and a tone and a little bit of grind well, on that's it. That's good know. to hear. That's you know? kind of good. So, oh, that's cool. So, what's the um, what's next for you then? You got many more yeah. dates in the UK. We got another week here, and then uh, we'll go back to LA and make a new record oh, because uh, yeah, I have a lot of ideas and. Uh, and is, so there, is there a permanent Jared Nichols band now? I know you've got a couple of your bandmates with you today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got these guys here, and they've been with me. Oh, I met them in L.A. right away. Right. So we've been, we've been cooking, and um, you know, we have a lot of cool opportunities for like doing some different recording at different studios. We're here. We recorded at Abbey Road. Oh, wow. And uh, you know, there's a, some great places. I did a bunch of stuff with Eddie Kramer, who worked yeah, yeah. with Hendrix. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so we're going to make a new record. And then next year, uh, we're doing a bunch of festivals over here. Oh, fantastic. Which and ones? And I know we're doing Ramblin' Man for sure. Brilliant. And we're doing uh, Hellfest in France with Aerosmith. And oh, wow. There's a few other uh, uh, festivals in the UK like Download and... Uh, it's a busy year then. We're going to figure it out. You know, we're going to keep kicking ass, you know. Oh, well, it's been an absolute pleasure you coming yeah, over. I'm going to so put a link in the description section below where you can find out more about Jared and his band. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that this video is going to be up in time. I think you'll be back in L.A. before this video goes up. Yeah, but if, yeah. we, if we do a really fast job, there might be like one 
gig left or something like that. But I, I guess next year. And when, next you, year. when you're back next year, come back. Come swing to. by, say hello. Yeah, I'll learn some more chops and I'll learn some other chords. <laughs> we can have there a different you go. jam. Awesome, It'd be cool. Man. All right, man. Well, thanks for watching and thanks ever so much for coming over. Thanks, man. Cheers, man. Yeah. See you later. Thank <laughs> you.